<clears throat> Welcome, friends, to this three-day program in Sebastopol. I'm very happy to be back here again and to meet so many friends and just to make some new friends also. It's always a pleasure to meet co-travelers on a spiritual path. We are all headed for the same destination. Some of us may have followed different routes to the same destination, but the destination remains our true home, the place to which we belong. It does not take very long for us who are on the spiritual path to discover that this world in which we are living is not our true home. This is a world of duality, world of pain and pleasure, world of ups and downs, and we and our souls don't belong to this. We are a steady people, we are steady souls. We are souls in love. We are souls who are full of love, who are made up of love. Love is a very steady thing. It does not have these ups and downs. But when we come to mental attachments, when we come to the way this world operates, we discover that this is a world of duality, ups and downs, pairs of opposites, and could not be our world, could not be our home. And that is why it is uh, a journey we are all taking together to our true home. Our true home, also known as Sachkhand, which means true home, is the place from where we came. It's a place with which we have a connection. Although we are visiting here in these different regions of experience, we have not forgotten our true home. We have within our bodies, in these physical bodies, and these physical bodies which are responsible for our physical experiences, we have within this physical body two very powerful instruments and those we have picked up in order to have experience in this physical body. Those two instruments are the instruments of sense perceptions, which give us the power to see, touch, taste, smell. These are here, these are the powers of sense perceptions that we are using while we are in the physical body. We also have another more powerful instrument called the human mind, which thinks, makes sense of things, rationalizes, uses logic, gives us advice all the time, and very often carries out our instructions. And most of the time, it gives us instructions what to do. So we have these wonderful things in order to have an experience in this physical world. We got these instruments of experience so that we could have a good time, see a different way of experience than in our true home, and then go back home. Somehow, we got caught up in these experiences and began to take the experiences as reality. We forgot that this was merely an experience. It was merely to see something and enjoy something different than our true home, and there, thereby appreciate our true home even more when we go back. We were willing to have an experience of pain and pleasure, experience of difficulties and easy things. We were willing to have all this so that we could go back to our steady state in our true home and enjoy it even more, get a greater appreciation of what our true home is. But we got caught up right here in this very experience of ours, which we take as a real world. We take this as the only reality in order to make it as real as possible, we did shut ourselves off from our true home. We decided that if we have to really enjoy an experience, we should concentrate on that experience and forget our true home for the moment. But we took a big leap forward in that shutting our own home from ourselves. And we are caught up here now. How do we know that we forgot our true home and this is not real. We did make some arrangement before we left our true home that in case we get tired of this experience, when we have had enough of it, we should have some key in order to open the door and go back. We made our own arrangement because we were more intelligent than we think we are. In our true home, we were all perfect intelligence 
So with our perfect intelligence, we were able to make an arrangement to go back home. And that key that we had was that during this experience, while we are here, we should be able to run upon some experience that will open the key and remind us of our true home and take us back. That experience in this physical world, which we think is a key to going back, is called a perfect living master, a human being, another human being like ourselves who appears in this world and just like other experiences becomes an experience of ours and tells us, this is not your home. Don't you remember that you made arrangement to go back? Don't you remember where your true home is? Did you forget that you created this experience around yourself within the true home? And now you have to awaken up and shed these outside experiences right here, leave them here, and go back home. A perfect living master is part of this experience. If this whole experience is illusion, the perfect living master is also illusion. It's an illusion like anything else. That human being is no different than any other human being. They are all part of the illusion. But it is an arrangement we have ourselves made that one part of illusion should be able to awaken us back to our true home. And we made that arrangement ourselves. It's a very good arrangement. When a human being who we call a perfect living master comes into our life, he reminds us of what we had arranged and tells us that you have an easy way to go back home because the home is not very distant from you. In fact, you kept it so close to yourself, you are almost operating in this experience from your true home. The true home is within yourself. And all you have to do is to go within yourself to find the true home. Such a person comes here not to teach us something because we have arranged many teachers for ourselves. There are so many teachers who come and teach us. They teach us how to live in this world. They teach us about spiritual things also. They teach us that our true home is somewhere else. They give us all detailed graphic descriptions of the route that we can take. But the perfect living master does not come here to teach us because we have been taught sufficiently already. He comes to be a partner and take us back together and we don't have to go alone on our journey back. He becomes a co-traveler of ours. He becomes a partner in everything, including our journey back to our true home. He draws us through many ways. First, he imitates the teachers because our mind, which we have been using and identifying ourselves with, likes to be taught. We like to learn. We think that without learning, nothing can be done. So we want to learn about everything. So he becomes a teacher to that extent to make us learn. Afterwards, we find what are we trying to learn? There's something more than learning on this journey, on this path. And then we discover that the learning is only for starting a journey and it does not go very far. Otherwise, we would, be, uh, uh, otherwise we would spend our whole life here learning. There are people who want to learn so much that they learn all their life and make no progress on the spiritual path at all. There are people who devote their whole life on studying books, on uh, attending lectures, on attending satsangs and going all over, uh, trying to research what is going on. They even write books of their own and they are very uh, occupied in their intellectual pursuits, but they make no spiritual headway. They don't move even an inch towards their own true home. So the learning part is very short when it comes to a perfect living master. When you uh, come across a perfect living master, you will find that the learning session is short, very short. Then the experiential method starts. Experiences of two kinds. One, that you can meditate and have an inner experience in which you can visually see things which are not there outside. And you can visually have experiences which show you that there are other worlds existing besides the one which we thought is the only reality. Those visual experiences can take us to a state where we find that our body, physical body, is merely covered upon an inner body. An inner body that carries the perceptions 
of the different senses. The sense perceptions belong to the inner body. And because the inner body is located within this physical body, therefore we are having the sense perceptions in the physical body. It's a great discovery to be able to do that, to be able to pull your attention to a place within yourself, within your body, which makes you know that this physical body is merely a cover upon our inner self, which is carrying the sense perceptions. When you are unaware of this physical body, or when you die in the physical body, the inner body, which carries sense perceptions, continues to operate. It is easy for a person to die and then know that there is an astral sensory body inside. But that person cannot come back and tell us because he has lost the physical body and we only communicate with people through the physical body. But we can ourselves have that experience. Each one of us has the possibility of seeing our own inner body separate from this physical body, embedded inside this physical body. <clears throat> the method is simple. The method is to use a practice which will make you unaware of this body. So long as you can forget that you have this body and you can pull your attention within and ultimately become totally unaware that you have a body, you will automatically find out that you have an inner sensory body which is carrying all the sense perceptions. To do that, we can follow a very simple method and that is called going within to your own self. When I say self, I'm not now referring to the physical body. I'm referring to the self that resides in the physical body, which you feel is inside the physical body, which you experience in the wakeful state that there is something inside you through which you see, through which you speak, through which you use this physical body. And that, as you can find out in a very short time of just some contemplation, that the physical body contains that self somewhere in the head. It cannot be in our hands and feet. It cannot be in the rest of the torso because we are opening our eyes and seeing from there. We are thinking from our head. We are doing everything that to use this physical body in a physical world from our head. Even in, the, in, even in the case of death, even in the case of physical death, we find that a person dies progressively, becoming unaware of the extremities first, becoming unaware of the hands and feet, and gradually losing consciousness of the torso. Ultimately, it's only when the brain is dead, the person is dead. Even when a person is half dead, he can speak to us and is not aware where the legs and feet are. We can see in the hospitals, there are people who are dying slowly and we can watch them dying, that the process is the same, that consciousness or awareness is withdrawn from the body progressively and ultimately it comes toward the head. Only when the brain is dead, the person is dead. This process is the same which we can use artificially in, in meditation by withdrawing our attention deliberately in the head. Now, if you close your eyes, and figure out what is inside your head, what's happening. We haven't done that because all our life we have been taught how to open your eyes and see outside. Keep your eyes wide open to see what's around, around you. So think and look outside. That's all we have been taught. So we have con constantly put our attention outside on outside things and never try to explore what is inside the head. Firstly, we think that and the, nothing can be inside the head. There may be a brain or something, but we can't see it. There may be something functioning, but there's no way to see it. When we close our eyes, it is dark. It's darkness that we see. It is darkness because we are constantly still looking outside, and when you put an obstacle in your vision, it naturally becomes dark. The eyelids close the eyes, you are still trying to look outside. That's not the way to look inside. You cannot look inside with these eyes. These physical eyes are designed to look outside. They are made to look outside. They have nothing in these eyes which can look inside. Therefore, what can look inside? Something can look inside which looks into what we can imagine. For example, if we close our eyes and imagine some figure, somebody's face, we can see it. These eyes are not seeing that. 
we can remember something that happened and close our eyes and remember exactly in front of us, these eyes are not seeing that. Which eyes are seeing that? We go to sleep and the eyes are closed and we have a dream in which we see so many things. Which eyes are seeing those? It is not necessary to see only with these eyes. In fact, when we try to see inside with these eyes, we always fail. And the tendency to see with these eyes is so strong that people fail in meditation because they close their eyes and they think they're meditating and the eyes are constantly trying to look outside and they can't see because they are shut. So there's no sense in trying to feel that these eyes have anything to do with any internal experience or going to see what is happening in the head. But we have a key, we have a, actually have quite a good clue how we can see inside from the power of imagination. We have already tried out while we are here with our eyes open that we can imagine things and see them in addition to what we are seeing with open eyes. And imagination can see things which we cannot see with these eyes. And therefore, would, we, would it not be a good idea if we use that power, not the power of seeing with these eyes, but the power of imagination. So if we close our eyes and imagine we are there, if we imagine we are sitting in that space which is dark to start with, what will happen? You can try, anyone can try, you sit for a little while, it's dark for a while, then images start appearing, some little lights start coming from here and there, some little dots of light start coming, faces start coming, whoever you want to remember comes up there, some strange faces start coming, just sit and try. Therefore, it's not an empty space. It is not a dark, empty space. There's so much going on there, but we can see all that with the power of imagination. Now we can say, what are we talking about? Imaginary stuff? Are we going to find reality through imagination? No, we are not going to find reality through imagination. It's just a tool. It's just a method. It's just a method to investigate reality. And since imagination can see without these eyes, we are just using imagination to transfer our attention from outside to inside the head. It's just a means of doing something. That since we don't know how to see inside, we're using imagination, not with the purpose of seeing reality through imagination, we are using imagination to transfer our attention, which is currently outside, into inside our head. If we are able to do that, other things will happen by themselves beyond our imagination. Other experiences will come way beyond our imagination, which you cannot imagine. But they come when you are inside, which means your attention is fully inside your head. The whole object of meditational experience is to get to know what is inside us. And can we sustain that inside experience? So when we use imagination, we can imagine things happening. That's, that's good. It's a good starting point to start putting your attention from outside to inside. But it is not good enough because you are still using a space between yourself and what you are seeing. And therefore your attention is not on the self. The attention is on what you can see with your imagination. It is not on the self. The next step, which is a little more difficult, but can be done, is to shift your attention from what you are seeing with imagination to who is seeing that imaginary things. That is the self. The self who with your eyes closed, when you can see something imaginary, shift it from there. Who is looking at all this? That is the self. Not easy, but you can. You know who's looking at it. And you suddenly find that you are always behind what you are looking at. And once you determine who you are and put your attention back on who is looking at the imaginary things, you are really reaching pretty close to your own self. There's a simpler way also of doing that. And that is to forget what is in front of you. Don't use imagination for that. Think that this body of ours is a house we are living in. And think that in this house there are many floors and we are on the sixth floor behind the eyes. And we close our eyes and figure this is a strange kind of house built like a body. And there's a sixth floor. And we are sitting in the floor of that house. And we've got a nice chair. And we are sitting in the middle of it. 
by that it becomes easier even to shift your attention from the vision in front of you to the self that is watching that vision. Because now you're not trying to imagine any vision or with your imagination, you're just imagining yourself being there. That makes it even easier. So once you can do that, that you are sitting in this place, and why I call it the sixth floor, because this physical body is being run, and physical experience is being run through several energy centers which are located in the body below the eyes. And they start from the bottom and all the six chakras, the six energy chakras, they almost constitute like six levels of energy experience. And those energetic experiences divide these six chakras and the eyes carry the sixth chakra and carry, and the eyes are a very important chakra. It's a very important chakra because it's a very important center of energy because when you look outside, it's a center of energy. When you look inside, behind the eyes, it's a center of awareness. It's a combination. It's the only point in the body where you meet both the energy point and the awareness point. There are many centers of awareness behind the eyes and above to the top of the head, but they are right behind the 12 more centers of, the, of different types of awarenesses, also in the body, also in the head. But the eyes are the ones that from where it starts, you will notice all meditation starts from the wakeful state. In the wakeful state, we are sitting behind the eyes, looking at the world from these eyes. But when we do yogic practices and we want to go down to the different energy centers, we lower ourselves from the eye center. We go to the bottom and progressively again come up from center to center, energy to center, energy center to energy center to the eye center. They refer to this as the two petal lotus, and the others are referred to as four petals, six petals, eight petals, twelve petals, and so on. Those petals are just a reference to the types of uh, organs that are there, which constitute those different experiences of energy. But the we start from two petal and end at two petal. We start our any kind of yoga, any kind of yogic experience in energy centers starts from the eyes, ends at the eyes. Similarly, these, the centers for meditation on awareness, on higher awareness, start from the eyes and ultimately goes right to the top of the sixth, of the 18th center. Six of these and 12 inside. Our true home lies at the 18th center. All these are built into the human body while we are still here. We have not lost connection with them because we packed everything into this small frame of a human body, including an access route to our true home, all built into this small little head. It's not in the whole body. It's a very small part of the body, little head of this few inches that carries this whole capacity to connect with all levels of experiences, all levels of awarenesses, including the awareness of our true home. So when we figure out that we are inside, behind the eyes, we start a new journey. And that's a journey of awareness. It's not a journey of energy. There's a difference between energy and awareness. In energy, you get the strength to operate. The energy centers are operating to create all our experiences in this world. They maintain the body. They move in circuits, and they maintain the energy in circuits so that everything can function properly in our connection with the physical world and the maintenance of the physical body. But when it comes to awareness, then the awareness pulls us back into different parts. For example, the first awareness, when you can pull your attention to the self, and you feel you are sitting there as yourself, what will happen? Depends on how long you sit there, with how much concentration you sit there. These are the biggest gifts given to us by the Creator. These are the biggest gifts we carry with us as human beings, the power to use our attention where we like, to locate it where we like, and the power to concentrate it wherever we like. These two things, attention and the power to concentrate it where we like, are the keys to discovering everything, including our true home. When we put our attention on our own self, behind the eyes, and concentrate our attention there, by concentration I mean thinking of nothing else, but thinking only of that situation. When you concentrate your attention there, the body undergoes the same experience as it go undergoes in physical death. 
the attention is pulled out from the extremities. After a while, you don't know where your hands are, where your feet are. You don't know where your body is. And the new body, inner body, opens up and you can see that it was always there. And you can fly with it. It has no weight. It has, all, it has very sharp sense perceptions. You don't need glasses to see. Everybody is better than 2020 vision in that. Even blind people have 2020 vision in the astral self. Nothing that is hindering us on the physical body hinders the astral body or the sensory body. The very first experience of having a sensory body that can fly out and can ex experience a new world, a world which is astral and ethereal in its nature, in its content, from which this world looks like a reflection, like a coarse reflection built into molecules, atoms, and physical matter. This material world is a copy made from the astral world. And when you move about and seeing the astral world, you also find that our own life there is very different. It has been very different from the life we have led here. We find that life has been much longer. We are able to locate our own homes there, where we have lived, what we have been doing. We locate that we have been doing research on things. We have been studying subjects which we thought we were studying only in the physical body. We were doing that already that we were mastering uh, different sciences and these things over there, which we thought we were just going to learn over here in the physical body, that everything that we have been doing here, we have been doing there too. And we have excelled in so many things there and diminished our capacity to use those sciences and the knowledge over here. It's a great experience. If you get nothing else out of meditation except to discover that there's an inner body of yours doing all this, I think it's a great step forward toward knowing that you are not the physical body, but you're more than that. And yet, we call it only the first step towards realization of the true self. It's only the first step on our journey to our true home. And once we reach that step, we have that wonderful experience. And yet, we are only another body. And the self, which we discovered sitting behind the eyes here, is also still sitting behind the eyes in the astral body. We have made great progress in discovering a new experience, great progress in discovering this is not our true world, this is a copy of another world, it's like an image, it's just like a shadow of the true world, and we found the true world. In the true world, we find such beautiful things like all the heavens that we talk of. Every heaven recorded in our scriptures, you can go and see there. The gods that we've been worshiping are actually sitting there. They're sitting on their thrones. You can see the gods of creation of this universe right sitting in that astral plane. It's not a small thing to see that the very basis of creation of this world has been discovered by going to step number one. There are so many teachers of pure spiritual awareness who take us to that state and call it our true home. Yet the space and time of that first step is just exactly like this one. It's only a little different that you can uh, slow down uh, your experience on that, on that plane. In astral plane, you can really stop time for a moment, which you can't do here. That's big feature. The big feature is, I remember when we were little kids, we used to play a game called freeze. And we were running around and somebody would say, freeze, and everybody stood wherever they were, whatever position they were in. And then they would unfreeze and then we could walk again. Now that was just a game. I didn't know that game had an origin in the astral plane where anyone can uh, freeze any moment they like. And then re unfreeze and it moves on. The capacity to have a nice moment, a nice vision, and freeze it doesn't exist here. We have some beautiful moments in life here, and they just pass, they just move on. We can't control them. At least there's one big facility there that if there's a nice moment which you enjoy, you can freeze it for as long as you like, and then unfreeze it and make it move. This is something very different from here. Similarly, the fact that your bodies are ethereal, that the bodies which we have, have the capacity to see, touch, taste, smell, and have the same shape as this body, gives it a very different experience. Those bodies can fly. 
There is no gravity to pull them down. There is no gravity in the astral plane. It's so different from here. So it's a great experience just to reach that point. And those who have reached that, they really feel it's like reaching heaven because it is heaven. Heaven is there. By the way, hell is also there. And I must caution that there is hell and some people have uh, in their great desire to explore more, gone into the hellish areas of astral plane also. Actually, the astral plane is very vast. It is much vaster than the physical plane where we see billions of galaxies around here. That is much vaster than this. And there are areas which are divided, which call them sub-astral. And there are higher astral planes. Then there are other, uh, other astral areas which are overlapping with the physical world. So when we go first time from there, we enter into the common area, which is an overlap of the physical and the astral world. That is where most of us go when we die. That is why when we die, the astral body stays in place, in the same place in the overlap, so we can still see people here. We can still see our own body that is dead. And we can see everything around here, but we are invisible to everybody else because we are not made up of that stuff which we can see. But we can see, our eyes can see in that state. So you can see people crying for you. You can see people trying to steal money from their pockets, which you thought were friends of yours. You can see a lot of things when you die and your astral body is still there. And people who loved you are afraid of you because you become a ghost. And if you try to tap them and say, look, I am here, I am still your friend, they say, a ghost is haunting us. Let's get exorcism or something to get the ghost out of you. The same people we love so much become ghosts and spirits, but they are just astral forms. We all have the same astral form inside us. They are no different. They, they have shed their bodies and are now in their inner form, and we have not yet shed our body. There's not much difference between us. But in so long as they are in the overlap section of the astral plane, it is so vast that we, they, can, they can move around here and they can, um, they can do things in their own plane. But those things do not always interact the same way in the physical plane. Here, the laws of nature, the laws of physical nature, are different from the laws of physical nature there. The laws of astral nature are different from the laws of physical nature here. That is why, although they can see us, they can communicate with us, they try to communicate with us, we cannot see them. We, we are afraid of them. There's no need to be afraid of them. There are two types of uh, uh, spirits that when, we, when they die here, there are two types of spirits. One, which roam around. They roam around to search for something that they couldn't find here. Or they were looking for something in this world and they were searching for it, they couldn't find. Now they are still roaming around in the overlap section of the astral plane. There are others who are stuck at one place and will not leave that place. In India we call, by two different names, these ghosts, we call them the ones who are Bhut. Bhut means one that roams around all over. And Pret, Pret is the one that is stuck at one place. When a person dies of an accident, a murder, something, or unnatural death, very often becomes a Pret and is stuck to that place because that's the place which haunts that person and haunts other people there. But those who are dying without that, but in search of something, they become uh, booths or uh, moving ghosts. But they are spirits like us. They are just astral forms of us. But their life is much longer, and they can be in that state for much longer than we are. The astral body, compared to our physical body, our physical body, what is its life? Time, uh, life, it's 100 years, less than 100 years, little more than 100 years. Um, so many people die much less than 100 years. It's a very short period. That life in the astral plane is anything from 1,000 to 3,000 physical years. So you can see that we have an inner self of ours who has lived much longer than the physical body we are wearing now. During this period, we have worn many bodies of different kinds, maybe of different species. We have worn many bodies during the period of one astral life. Therefore, it looks very 
strange when we go there that we can recall our experiences of past lives. We can recall things that have happened which are not past lives there. They're past lives here. They are the life of that one single life. Those events of that one single life, but they became past lives when there was physical manifestation, when we took on a physical form. It's such an interesting thing how we can take on certain costumes and create a whole new world and create a whole new experience. These are costumes upon us. And this is the physical costume. When we take it off, now we're wearing the astral costume and we have those wonderful experiences. But that is still a costume. Now, in spite of all these great experiences I'm talking about, it is still just one step towards our true home. And the perfect living masters who meet us at that state, inevitably, some teachers teach us how to go and say, that's the way, go. They stay here. They tell us to go. Some teachers say, OK, we'll show you the way, part of the way, then you have to go on your own. It's just self-discovery. Everybody has to find for themselves. Most teachers will say like that if they, have, if they are not perfect living masters. Perfect living masters who are connected with the home while they are here, who are connected with all levels of awareness while they are here, they do not leave us. In the astral plane, they are with us all the time. And they guide us how to go further. They are our guides, lovers, beloveds, at all times right up to our true home. They never leave us. So in, with their guidance, they tell us, this looks so beautiful, this looks like heaven. It is heaven, but there is more, and we have to go further. So they take us by the same process. They tell us, teach us, guide us, how to put our attention behind the eyes of the astral self. The astral self still has eyes like these. The shape is still like this. So the head is still like this. A little bigger, slightly bigger than this. So, but that, they teach us how to go within that. And by concentrating your attention within the astral form, you become unaware of the astral self and the whole astral world that was created by your being an astral self. And you open up and you find you have another form of yourself, but not a body, just a form. A form that could be called light, that could be called a, a, a shape. It's space and time. There is still space and time, but it's not like these. And no sense perceptions. Perceptions, yes. Sense perceptions, no. The power of total perception, the power to know things all at once, not by dividing them into seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, separate. That power exists in that self. It is from there that all this world has been created, that both levels have been created. That's the real stage from where the birth of these universes takes place. And it's the cause of everything that has ever happened in all three worlds. So we call it the causal world, and we call that body the causal body. But interestingly, what is the function of that causal body if it is not sense perceptions, it is not flying, it is not going out around like these bodies? What is the function? The function of that is to think. It is the same thing as the mind. The causal body is our mind. The mind that is thinking in the physical body is the causal body. When we separate it from this sense perceptions and separate it from this cover of the physical body, the mind functions alone and we find that was our self. And we find the mind itself was functioning to create these experiences of sense perception and the experiences of this physical body. It's a very great discovery of our own truth that these things which we thought were in time and space were being created by us. Time and space itself was being created from there. And everything that we've seen, what we called thoughts, what we called karma, what we called intentions, was all created there. We found that what we thought was karma being played out in the physical world was being created there. What we thought was karma being played out in the astral stage was being created there. There's the house of karma. There's the house of thoughts, house of the mind. And we are the mind, and that's our causal body. Nothing can be a greater discovery than that. Very few people have done that, I must tell you. It's not that uh, there are too many masters of that type available who can say that they've reached the causal stage and found the discovery of everything, all worlds. 
all three worlds have been created from there. It's a remarkable experience. It creates space and time. It creates cause and effect. It creates karma. It creates the two lower divisions of the astral and physical planes. It creates all sections of the astral plane. And that great place, the cause of all things, is the ultimate. And there we discover that what we thought of our individual mind in the astral body, the individual mind in the physical body, we thought we all have different individual minds and we think differently. There we discover these were just reflections of a single mind. That the origin of all thinking of all people was coming from a single mind, the universal mind that lies in the causal plane. What a, imagine this experience. I'm just talking about it. This is talk. Look at your personal experience and going into that stage, opening up and seeing you are that. And almost all great teachers, great masters who have gone and said that we have reached the universality from where all things are created have reached that stage. And they say that's the end of it. And yet a perfect living master says, no, this is just a cover again. The mind is also a cover. The mind is a body. It happens to be very creative. It happens to be very powerful. It happens to be the very source of space and time and everything that you have seen. But it is not yourself. You are still not in your true home. You are in a vast space created by yourself. But to go to your true home, you have to go beyond the mind. And then they tell us that within the mind lies the spirit. What is the spirit then? If the mind is not our self, what else is our self? There we discover that our self is the consciousness, the life force that makes the mind alive. Our soul, our life force, our true self is the one that empowers the mind to think and function, that empowers the senses to operate and, uh, and makes this body alive. It is the soul that is the real life force, that the power of consciousness is creating all this, and consciousness is our self and not any cover or any experience. The experiencer is our self, not the experience, no matter whatever it is. So even the best of experience of the causal region, where the universal mind can be explored, and the universality of everything can be explored. The self is still the one that is experiencing that, not the experience. And only a perfect living master now comes in who can take us beyond that. That is the definition of a perfect living master, according to me, who can take you beyond the mind. He will take you the same way. He'll take you by taking you to the experiencer within the experience. He'll take you within the causal self, within the mind. The mind is around it like a cover and he'll take you within and show you that the power that makes them alive is consciousness per se, that you are a soul, a source of consciousness and consciousness is that power which can make anything conscious and become available as experience. When he takes you beyond the mind, when a perfectly be master and he has not left your company, he will never leave. He'll be there at all times. That's the nature of this relationship between a disciple of a perfect living master and the perfect living master, he never leaves. He is a friend forever. He's a lover and beloved forever. At that stage, he takes you beyond, and takes you to show you that you are truly a soul and you're beyond all these things. That your unit of, unit of consciousness, a unit that has created all the experiences around itself by wearing these costumes, you have now shed all the costumes. And first time you can say, I know who I am, I am the soul. I am that consciousness unit and everything, including my mind, was just a cover upon myself. These costumes were put around me to have different kinds of experiences and I have for the first time seen myself as a naked soul, as a soul by itself. And I know I was the unit of consciousness and nothing else. If we can call totality of consciousness as the creator, as God, you discover you have been part of God. You're part of God. You're always a part of God. The whole show took place while you were still connected with God and were part of God. Your total consciousness was always connected with you. That's beautiful. People who take us to the stage where we can see our own souls, know our own souls, feel our own self as souls, and with no cover at all, not even a mind, we call them the perfect living masters 
of the order of sad gurus in india we call them sad gurus and there's one step still more and that step is to go from sad guru to sat guru the guru has taken to the sadhu stage which means the stage of the soul where you discover the soul and sat guru who takes you the truth ultimate truth the ultimate perfect living master who takes you beyond this unit of consciousness which you call the soul shows you that you are always part of the totality of consciousness you never left it that you're always part of god that you were never there the whole show took place right there and your connection with the totality was never broken now this is the most beautiful part of the spiritual journey that the connection of the soul with its totality our connection with our ultimate creator has never been broken even when we are here when you put on a cover it doesn't break your connection the connection is inward and is always there we are always connected now there must be something some evidence to show how we are connected so the evidence is that when we are feeling we are a self no matter in what form it is the same self it never changes you are looking at this world world can change but the one that is looking at the world never changes you go to sleep and have a dream in the dream you move around who is the person who moves around the dream have you ever noticed the same person who was awake not a different person in a dream you don't see other some other self of yours moving around it's the same self that's in the wakeful state it's the same self in the higher state the self never changes but there is something more than that it is not only that the self is continuously connected there is other evidence for that and that is there is something emanating from the self something that's visible if there was no experience the self could experience itself and what is that that's the main subject of my talk to you today that what is that which emanates from the self and exists if nothing else existed but the self if there was no creation whatsoever the manifestation of self to itself what would that be that we have no words to describe it my lecture ends because i have no words to describe it <laughs> but the truth is that because we have no words to describe it we have called it the word because we have no shabd to describe it we call it the shabd because we have no sound to describe it we call it the nad we call it the music we call it something and there is no word we can use it but for want of words we are using the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god remember that john's gospel remember the opening verses of the rig veda where it says the nad created this universe and the nad was the creator these are almost translations from one language to another when you see that we have no words for it but that eminence that radiation that something coming out of the self that can be experienced by the self that never is lost not even till now not even if we wear all the costumes of the world that power within the power of consciousness that never leaves us we can we can experience it after all we the experiencer are the self and the self is emanating something we should be able to experience it ourselves it appears in different forms that emanates from us what radiates from us right here in the physical plane it appears when we pull our attention inside to the self the very self i was talking about in the beginning that you close your eyes and feel that you are sitting inside that very self is generating that kind of eminence in the form of a sound which we can hear it's audible that's very great if the self can be heard what else do you want you just hear and you are to the self it's much easier than trying to use all kind of imagination and trying to figure out where the self is if the self can be heard is audible then you hear and you are towards yourself this audible self the audible sound that you can hear is coming from the self so 
a good way, the best way of meditation that I have found to discover the self is to listen to the sound, sound of the self. And listen to this with the same intensity of concentration, with the same concentration, it draws you to your self and opens up all these experiences that I've been talking about. If you stay on with that sound, which keeps on changing because of the nature of the universe in which we are doing it, because the nature of the creation that we are operating through, if you stay on with the sound, it will take you all the way to your true home because it's totally connected all the time, like the self is connected. That is why we know a way, a good way, a good route to our true home. And that is by way of attaching ourselves what looks like an ordinary sound here, but continues to change, ultimately to become the whole power of consciousness at the end. It's the same sound. We call it sound because it's sound here. It is not always sound all the way. It can't be sound where there is no space and time. It can't be sound like we know it here. But to start with, it's good to know it as a sound. But when you ride on it, when you're pulled by it, it has a pull that nothing else has. Nothing can pull you faster towards your true home than the sound. Sound has some other characteristics also. I'll mention to you the other characteristics of the sound. But first thing is, if we can hear that sound, when can we hear it? When you are able to, by your imagination, by your method of concentrating your attention behind the eyes, when you can sufficiently concentrate that you are beginning to get unaware of, of this body, the sound can be heard. In fact, sounds can be heard, several sounds can be heard even before that, which are not the sound of the self. They are sounds surrounding the self. And those sounds can also be used to help you to put your attention within. I call them practice sounds. There are several practice sounds coming from right or left or above or below, and you can play with them. You can play with those sounds and say, OK, that's only helping me to concentrate being in there, being inside with those sounds, just like I'm being inside with watching things around me, just a, just a practice to go there. But ultimately, when the sound that has pulled comes, it has a resemblance to a sound outside. The first sound is a very <coughs> melodious sound. It's a melody, and it comes in the form of some bells ringing at a distance. It looks like some bells ringing at a distance, but they don't have any sharp hit like the we ring, we dong, we hit the bell here. That's missing, but the rest is like bell song. It's got a rhythm in it, but similar to bell song. It can also be ref referred to some different kind of songs, sounds and songs that we hear, but it's very melodious. It is very subtle. That sound has a pull in it. When you put your attention to listen to the sound, it pulls you. And that's it's a secret. The secret of the sound is it can pull you. You don't have to put an effort to go to it. The effort is now shifted to the sound, and it can pull you in. That is why this particular kind of yoga, the particular kind of method of union with yourself, which is called yoga, the particular method is called the surt shabd yoga. Surt means attention, shabd means the sound. Yoga means union with your own self. So the attention, putting your attention on the sound to lead you to your true home is, I think, the, the best thing I have discovered. If there's something better, I am willing to learn even today. I've tried out a lot of things, tried a lot of things to get some higher awareness, but this is the best that has served me. And it's very, it's, it's very simple, not easy. It's simple, but difficult. Why should it be difficult if it is simple? It is difficult, we, we make it difficult. Uh, we use our mind to make it difficult. Now this is very silly to say that, but the truth is we use our mind to make things difficult. Not only in spirituality, in, in life. In life we use our mind, instead of solving problems, we try to make things difficult. Because we think too much. We don't need to think that much that we do. We can rely a lot upon our other faculties which belongs to that word, which belongs to the sound, which belongs to the soul. And those faculties, we don't use too much. We use the mind too much. What are those faculties that exist 
in the sound that exists in our self, that exists in our souls, that faculty is called intuition. A knowledge that jumps at us spontaneously, an awareness that just comes with no thoughts, with no words. It just suddenly you feel, also called gut feeling. You have a gut feeling, an intuitive feeling, and we reject that because we think so hard about it, it goes away. So therefore, if we were to use intuitive knowledge, our life would be much simpler. If we use less of thinking and more of intuitive knowledge and our gut feeling, it would be a wonderful life. You could change your life right here by just a little shift. Instead of making your decisions by thinking about it, make your decisions with your gut feeling. And then think how to do it. Put the mind to work to implement what your decision is rather than use the mind to make decisions. What is what we are doing? We are spending so much time using mind, that we're using the power of thinking to make our decision in life. And what happens? Today we say, yeah, this is a good decision. I thought about it. Next day, new factor comes in. Oh, I was sorry. I didn't know that. So we change again. And when you change two, three times, I am confused. <laughs> this is our life by using the mind too much. This doesn't happen. If you shift this to instead of using your mind, start using your soul. Start using the soul's faculty of intuitive knowledge, of gut feeling. What is the difference between a conclusion reached by using the mind and a conclusion reached by using intuition? The difference is the mind makes a decision based upon the data available to it right there in front of it. If something is missing, the decision is wrong. If something that is missing comes to your awareness next day, the decision was wrong. That is why it's a very limited decision which can be right or wrong all the time. And it does happen to be wrong, right and wrong all the time. All the time we have regrets. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I feel guilty why I did that. Why is that? Because we carried out our decisions and our actions based upon the thinking mind. Had you done it intuitively, this wouldn't have happened. You can try it out even now. Any time in your life, just switch from making your decisions with intuition and implementing them, carrying them out with the mind. Mind only looks at the data in front of it, at the evidence in front of it, and makes decisions. <laughs> intuition does not depend on that. Intuition is based upon the accumulated memories of ever several lifetimes coming up to it and giving you a decision. It has a much vaster, much greater spectrum of data from which it picks up its decision. It's not a small thing. This soul has been there with several minds, several astral bodies, several physical bodies, and is carrying all that with it and gives you an instant decision at that time. So therefore, our mind, our thinking mind has been so trained that we doubt our intuition and rely more on our mind. It's a, it's a sad thing that we should think so much and mess up our lives if we thought less but depended on this. Of course, I'm not saying that stop thinking because you cannot, nobody can stop thinking. I am saying use thinking in the right way. Use thinking to carry out what your decision is based on intuition. Use the power of directing your mind what to think. This is not happening today. What is happening is the mind thinks and tells us what to do. We have made a very good slave, a servant of ours, a computer driven by thoughts given to us to use. We are making it our master and saying, tell us what to do. Somebody has predicted that in 20 years, it will actually happen that the computers we are using today will be more intelligent than us, and they will tell us what to do. Somebody said, in 20 years, it'll happen. I said, we are doing it today. <laughs> we are using the same thing today. We are using this computer to tell us what to do. We should be using the computer for our purpose, to carry out our instructions. We should give the input, what is to be done. Not the computer should tell us what to do. Not the mind should be telling us what to do. Therefore, in order to direct the mind to think on the lines on which we want it to work, we have to practice something. In addition to trying to imagine you are there. In our life, daily life, we have to practice some things in order to make it easy for us to meditate. <clears throat> and that is, 
how to make the mind subservient to us. They say, man jita, jag jita, jag jita. That means whoever has won his mind has conquered himself, the world. Whoever has conquered his mind has conquered the world. Conquering the mind is the most difficult thing. One sage went that far. He says, if somebody came to me and told me that there is a guy who can drink all the water of the oceans, it's impossible. But for a moment, I can believe it. If a man says he has uh, thrown up all the mountains of the uh, world into the air, it's impossible to pick up all the mountains. For a moment, I might believe it. But if somebody says, I have controlled my mind, I won't believe it. <laughs> the sage went that far to say it's how difficult it is to control the mind. Because the mind we have made our master, the mind we have made ourselves. We have identified ourselves completely with the mind. And we say, I think so. That's I. That's the self. We think the mind is the self. We have never thought, I am using my mind to think that. Which is the correct thing. That you are using your mind to think in a certain way. So there, are, there is a will, a willpower, that is required to control the mind. There are two kinds of willpowers. A mental will, which is the development of the mind to express itself, which we have developed very well already. Our willpower is all based upon what the mind wants. The second is spiritual will, a will in which we strengthen our own real self in order to use the mind. And the spiritual will has still to be expressed through the mind. So we take a little part of the mind and use it to hit the mind itself. That means we use the same conversation that the mind uses in its thoughts. You know, the mind always speaks in words in the language we have learned. So we use the same language of the mind to deny the mind what it wants, again and again. And ultimately, mind gives in. How do we actually practice it? In our daily life, mind is tempted to do many things. When a particular temptation comes, not every day, say once or twice a week, mind says, I want to do this. No. The word no is being also said with the same mind. But no. But there's no harm. No. But it's very good. I can reason out. No. If you start denying the mind some of these things, do you know that in a few months you'll have control over the mind? And your life will change? It's a development of a will of your own, of the self, over the mind. When you are able to do that, you will find it much easier to meditate. Because it's the mind that carries you away in meditation. Most of the people who come to me and complain about uh, the lack of progress in their meditation complain the same thing. The mind is terrible, it always takes us away to these things. The mind is in control of them. Mind is in control of their meditation. Mind is in control of their trying to do what they want to do. Of course, simple method they use to control the mind is also similar to what I am saying. That is, repeat certain words, repeat a mantra, repeat a simran. What is the idea of repeating words of a mantra? So that the mind can't think of anything else. Try to bind it down, hold it down to these words. That's the same thing, but mind runs away again and again in meditation. But if you practice controlling the mind with a super will, with your own will, in daily life, once in a while, you'll find it much easier to hold the mind down to Simran or to the repetition of mantra while you're doing meditation. So spiritual path and the following of a spiritual discipline should not be confined to the few hours that you can give to the actual meditation. It should be part of life, that your whole life is designed to help in meditation, and the whole life should be designed that we are going to go home, and this is the way to go home. There are, of course, uh, many obstacles which are real. You have sickness, you have got uh, karma, people uh, taunt you. There are some people uh, who can't. There's a, there's a girl in India trying very hard to see me when I am in Delhi, and her parents won't allow her. She's crying so much. There's a circumstance in which she can't achieve and her desire is for finding spirituality. There are so many circumstances in our own karma that create obstacles. But let us not add more obstacles to that by trying the mind also to become an obstacle in our spiritual journey. Let's control what we can. Some events of life we cannot control. This life of ours 
is based upon our own actions in past lives. It is not based upon any fixed uh, format or something that makes a life. It's based upon our own actions of past lives. And we have done good things and bad things, and this good and bad is being determined by us because we are dividing it into a world of duality, into opposite spheres of opposites, so we have to have good and bad, and therefore we do good things and we do bad things, and we become human beings, and we go up and down based upon those. We get rewarded for good things, we get punished for bad things, but the life that we are having here is based on karma. Somebody once came to me, he says, I think my karma is over. I said, if it is over, you would be dead. <laughs> you can't be surviving, you can't be living without karma. It's only karma that's holding us. There was an American friend of mine, a great disciple of great master, my master's disciple, Dr. Julian Johnson. And he discovered after a few years of stay with the great master that karma is a great gift. Everybody was blaming karma. Oh, I've got bad karma. He said, that's a good thing. If you didn't have bad karma, you wouldn't be a human being. You would be in heaven. Thank God you are a human being and you can find a master. And then he said, that's a good thing. Good and bad are both there. It's like a plat platform given to us, like a gift. Now you can go home. So he discovered that we should never say it's bad, good karma. If it is too heavy, if it is too painful, yes, it's all right to pray for help. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if we can get some divine intervention in lowering the pain of our karma, it's worthwhile and should be done. But I am not suggesting that day and night we mourn over this karma and say, when will it end? Then I will have a good life. You will have no life after that. <laughs> it's the karma that's creating this life. The whole thing, every moment of ours that we are spending in life with this physical body is based on karma. So we can have a lot of Karma of the kind where we can't control anything. But there are some things we can control. Now the spiritual journey is dependent upon what you can control. So that is why I say, let's control that part of the mind which is constantly becoming our boss, boss our master. And that is deny it and say, I am in control. I am the boss, not you. To be able to turn the mind around and mind is Mind is actually quite flexible that way. I can tell you, there are two ways to control the mind. One, use your super will, deny it what it wants, and make sure it knows you are in control and the mind cannot lead you where it wants to. Once in a while even. And the second is, give it extraordinary taste of something it likes. Mind loves pleasure and taste. Mind will run after any kind of pleasure and taste. Give it some pleasure inside. Find out some goodies inside. There's some very nice, uh, tasteful things inside. And they're very beautiful sights inside. Beautiful experiences inside. Give a few of them, throw them to the mind, and mind will be your friend and go with you. There are two good methods. But in the beginning, when we haven't found those goodies ourselves, how will we feed the mind? So first, let's find ourselves, and then we can feed the mind. Uh, I am very happy that I got a chance to share these experiences with you. And uh, I have uh, requested uh, George, our host here, to get some questions, if you have, written up on small pieces of paper, and I can attend to those questions. So uh, thank you very much for very patiently listening to me. And I hope these uh, tips will be useful. What I'm sharing with you are by uh, tips from my personal experience. They are not tips from a textbook, because I don't know any textbook that carries them. But they, I do carry them as my personal experience on this journey. Since we are all traveling together, I thought I will share these uh, tips on the way to our true home with all of you who are on the same journey. So now if we have some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. What are the ways to develop the spiritual will? Can you give us examples of things we can do? What are the ways to develop the spiritual will? Can you give us examples of things we can do? I just answered it. mind is an agent of cause. It always tries to, to hinder soul growth. Does the mind know the future of the soul? I'll read out the question so it can be loud. Since mind is the agent of cause, it always tries to hinder 
soul's growth. Thus the mind knows future of the soul. As I explained earlier, the mind is merely an instrument given to us to think. It's not an independent entity. By empowering it, we make it an, like an independent entity. And therefore, once we pull that power from the mind, it is just a slave of ours, a subject, it's an instrument of ours, a computer of ours to use as we like. The mind knows nothing beyond what we know. It does not know the soul's future at all. The mind pretends to know. Mind pretends to know everything because we have empowered it. So once we are able to uh, take the mind under our control, you'll find it's a very limited knowledge, very limited activity, and we use it to our benefit. After baptism, Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. Did you go through a period of deciding between God and Mother Nature? After baptism, Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. Did you go through a period of deciding between God and Mother Nature? I am not Jesus, nor am I anything like that. So I can't compare with his experience at all. My experience is one of a disciple, of a great master, who took control of everything. And he kept the devil away. And every time the devil appeared before me, which he did in my younger days, he made sure he couldn't harm me. Every person initiated by a perfect living master is protected from the devil in the sense that the devil can do no harm. But the devil can appear. The devil can even frighten, but can do no harm. That's a guarantee at the time of initiation by a perfect living master. Can you please speak about the relationship between creative and spirituality? Could you please speak about the relationship between creativity and spirituality? Creativity, as we know it here in the world, is of the mind. The mind has a certain function of creativity and uses that function to create new patterns, new designs, new algorithms, new all new creative things are coming from the mind. It uses the power of the soul to do all these things. The spirituality is to transcend the mind and find the source of all this, not to be creative. When we die, all of our light will in front of us, in front of our eyes, like a news. All do all the light events run in front of your eyes when you enter into the upper regions. I mean, dying while living. When we die, all of our life events run in front of our eyes like a movie. Does all the life events run in front of your eyes when you enter in the upper regions, I mean dying while living? These are different subjects. Dying while living refers to your capacity to withdraw your attention and open up your knowledge and awareness of your inner body while you are still alive here. That's dying while living. You have the experience of death, which you will have when you actually die, but you can have it while you are living, uh, pulling your attention up. This has not, nothing to do with the events that you flash before you, which are used to create future karma that happens at the time of actual death. When actual death takes place, your life flashes in front of you in reverse. That means it is not from the birth to the death, it, it's from the birth, last few events, and then goes backward to remember the childhood and so on. Those flashes that come in front of you at the time of death are the basis of the next life that you will go into. So the very last moments of one's physical life are very important function for the next, creating the next life for you. So that does not happen when you are practicing meditation for dying while living. That doesn't happen. Anybody has questions which we can put on and later on the afternoon session and you can give them in these pieces of paper if you want the paper. Uh, he'll give you more paper or you can write on the back of these. <laughs> let, let me save some paper. Well, we'll take a break and uh, we'll be back here at 3 o'clock again and uh, we'll take up some questions and answers which you may have. You can give those questions and if you like, we can have a meditation session. How many of you would like to actually meditate and practice what we're talking about? Okay, we'll have a meditation session also today afternoon. Thank you very much.